my name is Stephanie. I'm going to be your educator today and today we're going to learn how to make these adorable danglers. I've got a few up here but just to kind of go over what you should have at home we have our written tutorial and in this section there are pictures step by step of what you can do to create this project and it also has a little materials list on the side so that you are up and ready to go for when we start. And then this section here is actually the machine steps, which will tell us step by step which step is going to happen on the machine. So for example, um, we are going to start with the D slash AE 1-1, and that is the little cat head and the cat body. So if you wanted to stitch along with this video, that is the first one we're gonna start off with. And before we do jump in, I just kinda wanted to go over what the final stitch out looks like. So this is the image that you would have in your book. So this is the exact stitch out that we used for the image in your tutorial. So we've got the little cat and then it has this cute little dangly tail and these cute little paws here. And then they're attached with buttons. So I'm gonna show you how to do all of this. And then most of it can actually be done in the hoop, which is really great. And I also wanted to show you a different version of that. So when you're making these danglers, they're, it's really, really great when you get to test out different materials. So here we use minky for the paws, and we've got wool actually that's been repurposed from a sweater, and we use that for its little sweater. So you can see there's a lot of differentiation between them, and you can get really creative and experiment with all kinds of different colors. So to start, I have already cut all of my fabric, so I don't have to do any prep work there, and I've already hooped my stabilizer. For this project, we're gonna use a tearaway stabilizer. So you can also use a wash away stabilizer uh, versus a tearaway, it's totally up to you. If you wanted to use a wash away stabilizer, the only difference between that and a tearaway stabilizer is that you need to use a little bit of water or moisture just to get rid of the extra stabilizer there. So we'll talk more on that later once we get closer to finishing the project. So to start, go ahead and load your design file. Again, we're starting with a little cat body and head. And when you start your project, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a placement stitch for our first applique. That is actually going to show up here on this page with our machine steps. So step number one on this page is going to be step number one on your machine. So it says placement stitch and then place your applique fabric. So that's what we're going to do next since this one just finished stitching out. And so I've got this little gray piece here that I'm going to use. I'm just going to set it face up on top of the placement stitch. And it's really important to make sure when you place that fabric on top that you are completely covering that placement stitch because otherwise you're going to have a little bit off center. It's going to be kind of wonky and you're not going to cover it completely. So make sure that it's all the way on top and then keep moving forward. The next stitch is going to be the tacking stitch, which is gonna go around twice and that will hold your fabric in place for the next step. So once you have completed the tacking stitch, you're going to carefully remove the hoop from the machine and then you're going to trim away the excess fabric. So for this project, I have trimmed up close to the tacking stitch for m the majority of the applique, but I'm going to actually leave a little bit on the end here. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of stitching going on towards the bottom. And when that there's a lot of extra stitch work, then you're gonna get a little bit of tugging. And in your tutorial, a lot of times it will mention where you're going to trim completely up to the tacking stitch and when to wait to trim. So this is just kind of a little tip and trick from me because I digitized the collection. So um, once you have finished cutting it out, you're gonna put it back into the machine and, and to stay in line with maintaining the same thread colors as your applique fabric, I'm actually going to change it up here. 
and I'm going to have a purple sweater. So I'm going to take this purple fabric here and then I have a thread that I have matched closely to it. And we're using Floriani threads, but of course at home, if you have a different thread brand, you're more than welcome to use it. Use any colors you like. There are no rules to your creativity. So I'm just gonna thread the machine. And run the next placement stitch. Okay, so once you have completed the placement stitch here, you're going to again remove the hoop very carefully from the machine and place it away from the machine. And we're going to take this applique fabric and place it on top of the placement stitch. And again, making sure that we cover that placement stitch entirely. And then we're going to put it back into the machine and run the next tacking stitch. Okay, so now that we've finished the next tacking stitch, we're going to again remove the hoop from the machine, then place it to the side, and we're going to trim up close for this one. And when I trim, I actually pull the fabric a little bit as I trim, and that's how I get a really close, clean cut. Um, if you try to trim from too far away, then what you're going to end up is with a really jagged sort of edge to your applique and then what ends up happening is you have a little bit of fabric that sticks out from underneath that satin stitch. So if you cut very closely then you won't have that problem. See I've got a little piece here that's sticking out. Just make sure that you snip it away really carefully. Try your best not to pop too many stitches while you're cutting away all the excess fabric because otherwise it might start to pull away. So it's really important to maintain as many tacking stitches as possible in your stitch out. So we're going to keep going and we're going to keep placing those appliques. So again, if you are feeling kind of lost, always refer back to your machine steps. Those picture steps are really great to have when you're trying to learn a technique and you're trying to figure out what your hands are doing during your stitch out. But that machine step page is your roadmap so that in case you get lost, those machine steps actually correspond to the same machine steps that you see on your screen. So that is a really, really great, great way of uh, maintaining organization and just knowing exactly where everything's going to stitch. So now we have completed the placement stitch for the ears. We're going to remove the hoop from the machine, place it to the side, and then pick up our fabric and place that on top. And so to conserve fabric, I have cut two separate pieces. But if you're just using scraps and you, you know, you're not particular about how much fabric you're going to use, you can just use one big piece of fabric to go across as well. But I like to conserve. So we're going to take that, put it back in to the machine, and we're going to run the next tacking stitch. So if you're ever worried about your applique kind of flying around a little bit, um, like I cut these two smaller pieces here, and so you know if the wind blows just right, they're going to fly off. So if you're concerned about that, then you can use some embroidery tape and you can actually just take a tiny piece of embroidery tape or surgical tape or whatever kind of tape you like to use at home and you can just kind of use that 
to hold it down. So if you're afraid of it flying off, just use some tape. So we're gonna trim away this applique up close and personal. Trim away any excess that's kind of sticking out. Clean it up as much as possible. And now we're ready for our next piece of applique. I'm gonna put it back into the machine. And again, I'm gonna change up the colors. We're going back to gray for this next part so that the kitty cat matches. So I'm gonna switch over to the gray fabric and the gray thread so that my tacking stitches match my fabric. So now that we've finished the placement stitch for the face, we will again take the hoop out, place it to the side, and place our next piece of fabric. So once you start getting used to this, it's gonna be like clockwork. You're just gonna know exactly, bing, bang, boom. Be able to take everything out and finish it much faster. So we're placing it there, and now we're gonna tack it in place. So we have tacked our face into place and we're gonna trim up close. Now we've got just one more piece of applique to finish on top and then we'll be on our way to decorative embroidery. So the hard part is almost over. So we're popping it back in. And again, I'm going to change my thread to match the little mouthpiece. And for that, we're gonna go with white. Okay, so we've got the placement for the last piece of applique on top. So I'm gonna take that out and put the next applique piece on. And I've gone with a white here just so that it has a nice little contrast because we're gonna have some details on the mouth. As you can see in the stitch out, there are little details here. And so if you keep the same dark background with the mouth, you're not gonna be able to see all those cute little details. So we're going with a white this time around. Okay, so we have tacked the mouth in place. I'm gonna remove the hoop from the machine and trim it away up close. And there we go. So we have all the applique placed on the front of the fabric. And we're gonna put some more applique on the back. We're gonna have one larger piece, but we won't have to worry about that just yet. But once you have trimmed everything away, it's time to follow those machine steps so that you know exactly what's coming up next. So if you follow along on your papers, see I have my printout here ready for me. And on my machine, it says that I'm on step 11 of 24. So when you're looking at your paperwork and your machine steps, that's 11 of 24 steps. So 
here it says that we're using 485. That is a Floriani color and it is kind of a medium gray. But again, you can use any color that you like. You don't have to follow those colors exactly. You can get really creative like I did with this one. I actually used a variegated thread. So this one has some white and gray and black in it and it all kind of looks a little bit more like fur. It's a little less flat. So you can try all kinds of different ones. And of course, if you want like a psychedelic cat with like rainbow or neon stripes, you can do that too. Make your own little Cheshire cat like from Alice in Wonderland, whatever you like. There's no Anita police, be as creative as you like. So we're gonna switch it up. I'm gonna use black thread for my little cat stripes. Okay, so we have finished the face markings. I'm gonna kind of take it out just to show you really quick what it looks like once you have stitched out the face markings. And now we're actually going to do a finishing stitch for this little mouthpiece. When you're picking out colors for your finishing stitch around a piece of applique, you wanna make sure that you're matching the fabric as closely as possible, unless it's different from your artistic vision. But in this particular case, we're gonna match it closely with this fabric. So I'm gonna get a different color thread. And as I move along, I'm just gonna kinda of change out the threads just to match those appliques. And then we're gonna to get to some decorative embroidery as well. And you can get really creative with those threads as well. Alrighty, so now we have the finished satin stitch for the little snout. I'm gonna pull this out and I wanted to show you because I kind of made a small boo-boo where I trimmed a little too closely to the mouth area here and it kind of started to pull up. It's not the end of the world though. I'm just gonna kind of press it down and kind of pay close attention to it just to make sure that it doesn't keep on pulling. But this is what I mean when you, you trim a little too close, it starts to kind of come undone. So I'm just gonna pay close attention to that um, as it stitches out. And if you're ever worried that your fabric is gonna start pulling out, that's okay. Um, you can actually use a little bit of tape to hold it down. And it usually does a pretty good job of holding your fabric in place as it continues to stitch out. So um, the kind of rule of thumb in my book is to complete a stitch out with fabrics and materials that maybe you're not you know, too concerned about, so that way you kind of understand how your design will stitch out before it's completed. And then once you have stitched it out and gotten used to the design, then you can start making the, the projects with fancier fabrics and start making them for gifts and things like that so you know what to expect as you're stitching everything out. So um, again, I'm gonna put this back into the machine without any tape. If it continues to pull a little bit, I'm gonna put some tape on there and I'm gonna kind of show you what that looks like too. So here's the part where I'm gonna pay really close attention because it is going to stitch out on the area that's kind of pulling. So I just wanna pay attention here. Of course, watch your hands, make sure that it's not too close to the needle there. And it looks like it's holding up all right. Okay, so it looks like it didn't go too far, but just to show you what to do in times of crisis, are to just take your piece of tape, just a small piece, make it really subtle. And this is the part that's kind of doing a little flappy do here. So I'm just gonna take a little piece of tape and use it like a Band-Aid right on top of there, just so it doesn't keep 
shifting out of place. Now, the rest of the digitizing, there's some here. If you pay attention to the completed stitch out, there's just one more thing left in this area, and then it's gonna do some more decorative stitch work up top, so I'm not gonna have to worry too much about this little guy anymore. But that's what to do, just in case your fabric starts to kind of pop out. Okay, for this next portion, I'm going to use black thread because I really want those letters to stand out because it's gonna say wipe your paws, if you remember from the stitch out. And um, for the version that I have stitched out on my own, I actually have used a variegated thread and it's much harder to see. So this stitch out is actually a good example of what not to do when you're picking out your thread colors. Um, and again, this is the first one that I stitched out because I wanted to stitch it out first to see how it worked before I did with my nicer materials, the materials that I really, really wanted to use for this project. And I also wanted to experiment with lots of different colors and materials. So in this particular case, I used a variegated thread. That means that it's kind of transferring from one color to another. And it goes from dark pink to white. Um, and it looks really, really cute, but it's actually kind of hard to see when you have it on top of this wool. So it's really important to use your best judgment. Um, but more importantly, if you're not sure how it's going to look or how your project will respond to certain threads, then it's definitely important to experiment with those first. You can try sewing by hand using that particular thread, or you could just stitch something out that's really simple and easy and just kind of stitch it out in all the different types of threads that you have just so you know what they look like once they're done stitching out. So at Anita, we use a lot of different types of thread. And as I said earlier in the project, we are using a Floriani polyester thread. Um, and the reason why we like these particular threads is that they're very, very shiny, but sometimes you might not always want the shiniest type of thread that you could possibly use. So there's lots of other types of threads. There are cotton threads and there are wool threads. Um, and then there's actually some thread that has ceramic that's actually been woven along with the thread and it turns out to be a very cool matte finish. So it almost looks like porcelain. Um, so all of them have a different effect. And um, until you see them in person and see them stitch out, it's it's harder to pick out which ones you want to do first. So again, use your experimental brain, try out all these different things. Don't be afraid to try something new. If you see something at your local quilt shop um, or craft store that just looks very interesting, go ahead and grab it and try it out. Do something new, do something fun. Um, and then of course, send it to us. Let us know what you like. So I'm going to pause it here just to kind of show you here, if your machine doesn't trim all the way and it kind of moves from one end to the other, you can actually pause your machine and kind of trim those away as you move along. I know for me, um, if I leave those threads stick like there um, and I don't take them out till the very end, they become much more difficult to trim. So if I trim as I go along, then it's much easier to get a really nice clean stitch out. So I'm just gonna go ahead and trim up these wayward threads, get them out of the way, and then continue on with my stitch out. Okay, so now we're on step 15, and if you are paying close attention to your machine steps, it's going to say, 516 sweater outline. So, um, 516 is in reference to a Floriani color, and we won't be using that particular color for this project because again, when we do an outline for our applique fabrics, we wanna try to match that color fabric the best we can. So I'm actually gonna use the color 624, which is the closest to our sweater, and I'm gonna trade that in with the other colors. And again, I gotta really stress, those machine steps are going to be your guide. A lot of machines actually have a little window that you can see what's happening next in the stitch out. But sometimes, um, for example, if we have chosen the color white for a thread, 
it doesn't always show up in that little box. So you might look at that box and see completely empty and you're like, what's happening to my stitch out? So what you have to do is you have to check your machine steps. And in your machine steps, it's going to say probably white thread and it will tell you exactly what's gonna stitch out. So that way, um, it's a very good road map just to keep you on track. So for some more information about the threads that we're using, this is a standard 40 weight thread. Um, that's the standard for embroidery, but of course it comes in a lot of other weights too. And for some of our projects, we have used as heavy as a 12 weight thread, and that's usually like the wool or the cotton thread, so they're a little bit thicker and denser. Um, and for projects like this with a pretty dense satin stitch, you won't want to use a thicker thread because then it'll kind of get bunched up and it'll be a little bit too dense. So for a lot of our stitch outs, you want to defer back to the instructions and it will tell you exactly what type of thread that we're using. So if a particular project says that we're using a 12 weight wool thread or a bermelana or a cotton thread that's a little bit thicker, we're gonna let you know so that way your stitch out turns out correctly. Um, if you're wondering what kinds of needle to use for the different types of thread that you pick out, we use the 7511 uh, needle, the 7511 needle, so that is the standard for embroidery thread. Um, if you wanted to use a thicker needle or a top stitch needle, those work well too. Um, I've talked to all kinds of people and people use all kinds of needles. Um, no matter who you talk to, they're probably going to say something different. So it's all about personal preference and again, a lot of experimentation to find out exactly what you prefer. So when I'm using a heavier thread, like the 12 weight or even an 8 weight in some situations, um, I'm going to use that top stitch needle because it has an, a larger eye and it fits that larger, thicker thread through the eye much more easily. Um, if you try to use a heavier weight thread with that standard needle, you're going to find that there's a lot of pulling and there's going to be a lot of extra fluff because it's just that tension is really tugging on that smaller eye. Um, so you want to make sure that you're using the correct needle as well when you start experimenting with those other types of threads. Okay, for this next bit we're going to stitch out the little nose. So that's just a really, really small part. And we're getting closer and closer to putting on that back fabric. So we're getting to the exciting part soon. Okay, so now we're moving on to the ear outline. And you might be wondering why we're not doing all of the outlines all at once. And the reason for that is we want to try to limit as much of the excess as possible in terms of excess thread on the back. So you can see on the back of this design, we actually have really nice clean lines. If we were to leave the, if we were to do all of the outlines before we put the back fabric on, then you would end up with like a big crisscross in, in, of different types of threads and things going across and it won't look as pretty. So what we're trying to do is create like a really professional looking completed project once we're done with it. So for the outline on the ears, I actually want to do the opposite of what I've been telling you to do, which is um, instead of matching the ear exactly with that color, I'm going to take the color that I would outline the rest of the cat face because what I'm doing here is I'm just, I just want the inside of the ear to be pink and then I want the rest of the ear to look like the cat's fur. So the cat has a little pink inside of the ear. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pick out my dark gray thread, which is what would be the outline for the dark gray cat and I'm gonna use that as the outline for my ears. Okay, so now we're going to actually do part of the outline for the top of the head, um, so I don't even have to change the thread, which is awesome, we love this. So this part here is why it's really important to have a Band-Aid when you need it. So I've got my little Band-Aid, which is holding up pretty well, um, and as 
it continues to stitch out, it actually tugs on the fabric a little bit more. So even though we anticipate that it will tug a little bit, it's important to use band-aids when you need them so that way it will continue to work in the end. I know it's hard to believe, but we even messed up here, so. <laughs> okay, so if you're following along with your machine steps, we are on step 19, but if you pay close attention to your steps here, we just completed 18 and it said the top of the head outline, which we just completed, and then it has in an italicized font, then place back fabric. So it's really important to read the directions to completion because if you kind of read this part, jump ahead to the next part, it gets a little bit confusing. So you wanna make sure that you're reading the whole sentence before moving on to the next step. So everything that is written in this italicized font is what you wanna do with your hands. So what we're gonna do is we're going to take our hoop out of the machine very carefully. And if you remember, I waited to trim here. I'm gonna keep waiting to trim and I'll show you why shortly. I have a little secret to that. So I'm gonna put the back fabric on and what I'm gonna do is flip this over really carefully. And I'm going to take this larger piece of fabric here and it covers the entire stitch out, the entire back of the design and I'm gonna place it face up on top of the design here. So once it's good and centered, I'm going to take my handy dandy tape and I'm gonna tape it in place. So this part is really important to remember because when you use tape, especially if you're using a really sticky tape like I'm using now, this is special tape for embroidery and it's embroidery specific, you wanna make sure that you're getting all of these corners pressed down really tight because if you leave a tiny corner sticking out, what's going to happen is your tape is going to get stuck on your embroidery arm and then it's just gonna start pulling back further and further until your design gets stitched out like this with all of the other stitch work on top of that. And it's happened to me a hundred times and it's infuriating. So I want you to avoid it by any means possible. So I'm gonna be very, very careful as I put this tape on. And if you are in doubt or afraid that it will come off for any reason, use as much tape as you need because this tape actually in particular, this pink tape, you can use it multiple times. So don't be shy about using that tape. Another thing that you can use, which I actually prefer a lot of times, is to use 505 temporary spray or whatever brand temporary spray that you have. A lot of quilters have access to this kind of spray. And you just do a quick spritz on top of the project and it actually holds it in place. But you wanna be really careful when you use that spray because sometimes if you use too much of it, then you end up staining your fabric. So again, use best judgment, experiment beforehand before you jump into using new materials. So I have taped it really well and I'm going to put it back in and I'm going to go ahead and do it in just the same gray thread because the majority of the stitch out is in this gray color, so it's okay to go ahead and use this gray thread. I am going to actually take this out of the machine and flip it over and trim the back side first. And the reason why I trim the back side first is because sometimes I get so excited about finishing the project that I forget to trim it in the first place. So if I just make it a, the habit, of trimming the back fabric first, then I'll always remember to trim it. Um, it's really easy to get hung up on the project because you're getting closer and closer to finishing and you just kind of want to move, move ahead as fast as possible, but you have to stop and kind of remind yourself, like, oh yeah, there's some other parts that I'm forgetting about. So I'm just gonna quickly trim out the back fabric and I'm actually gonna take these pieces of tape and set them to the side in case I need them later. And you can also use fresh tape if you want. You don't have to conserve if you don't want to. It's up to you. And again, I'm being really careful not to trim too closely again. I learned my mistake last time. 
and I want to avoid using band-aids as much as possible because it's kind of a hassle. Okay, so now that I have trimmed the back, it'll look like this. We've trimmed up to the tacking stitch without trimming the actual tacking stitch itself. And then now I'm going to trim the front. So I am going to leave my little band-aid, my little pink band-aid at the bottom until just before we stitch that section out. And I'm just keeping the band-aid there for safety purposes. Um, there's no particular rhyme or reason other than it just makes me feel better about it. So I'm going to put this back in and we're going to keep running those outer satin stitches. And actually, what I'm going to do is match my bobbin to my top thread. When we're starting the back of the design, we want to do our best to match the bobbin thread to our top thread. So I have pre-wound a bobbin and already installed it. So I'm going to put it in here. And if you want, you can actually change your bobbin thread to match every thread that you have on top. But since for this project, we have the same color all along the back, I'm just going to keep the same dark gray bobbin thread throughout the whole design. But of course, it's your design. You pick whatever bobbin colors you like. And we're going to start off with the next part of the design, which is the outline of this back part. And again, I'm going to keep this Band-Aid here for now as we continue stitching. Okay, so we're going to continue on with our outline stitches. And we're actually going top to bottom because that is the same order that we put our applique is down. So we're going to continue on with our outline stitches. So now that we have completed our stitch out, we're going to carefully remove it from the machine and we're going to take it out of the stabilizer. So right now we're working with a tearaway stabilizer and I'm just going to kind of peel it out. Um, and that's why I like tearaway so much is because you don't have to cut anything. It really just comes right away and it's done right out of the hoop. So sometimes you're left with some little frillies along the edge here. Um, you, and there's a lot of different ways to get rid of these little frills along the edge. So I'll take that out of the way here. Um, one thing you can do to take away these little hairs along the side is you can literally just trim them away if you like. Um, so you just take your embroidery scissors or little snips and really carefully kind of snip it away and give it a little shave. Um, that is a really simple way of getting rid of them, but it's also a little bit dangerous because then you can also accidentally trim away some of these finishing satin stitches, which I've done many times before. Um, so another thing that you can do is sometimes you can actually melt them away using a lighter or a candle, but of course use lots of caution there because of course you could melt your thread as well. Um, and then another thing you can do is you can actually kind of take a Q-tip, like a wet Q-tip, and then just moisten the edges so that they're easier to pull away. And just you can just kind of yank them out once you've moistened them. Um, of course, that also depends on your fabric because you don't want to create any water stains if you get it a little bit too wet. So once it's done, we uh, have to cut these little buttonholes away. So you can actually take a seam ripper like this and you can just kind of stick your seam ripper in to this little buttonhole and as you can see I matched my buttonholes to the fabric that it is on top of so we've got the dark gray thread and just really carefully push this seam ripper in to from one end and to the other um, and you can also use just kind of a, any, any kind of tool that will cut into that little space 
with a lot of precision. And so if you have extra good scissors, you can also just fold the buttonhole in half and then just kind of snip into it and get into there from there and just do it like that. So there's a few different ways of freeing up those buttonholes. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. Use extra caution when using your seam ripper so that you don't accidentally poke yourself. And you also don't wanna use so much pressure that your seam ripper just kind of slides on through and goes all the way across because that could also potentially happen. So just be super, super careful when doing this. Okay, so once you have opened up all the buttonholes, it's actually time to start on the limbs. So what you're gonna do to start the limbs is you wanna go back to your machine and you wanna load the next design. And for this particular design, we have our little cat here, which we just completed. And then we have the limbs with the little yarn ball and the tail with the loop for hanging. Um, so if you are in doubt as to which one to, that corresponds to that design. First of all, we've put them all on one page, so we've made it visually easier. But if you're not looking at these actual images and you wanna make sure that you're loading the correct design, they actually have numbers that correspond to each other. So this is D-AE1-1, so that's the first design, the first design for number one. And then we have D-AE1-2, Two. So the one and the one correspond and the one and the two correspond. So this is number two of the first design. And all of the other designs will follow that same pattern. So in the second design, it will be 2-1, 2-2. The third design, it will be 3-1 and 3-2 and so on. So it'll all follow that same correspondence. So uh, the next step is to hoop your stabilizer and start on the limbs. So once you have loaded the next design, you're going to hoop a new piece of stabilizer and follow the same techniques that you did with the last part of the project with the cat. So you're gonna take your machine steps and follow them just like we did with the last project, all the way up to putting on the back fabric and matching our bobbin thread. So now that I have finished the limbs, I took them out of the stabilizer and I'm ready to put the buttons on. So if you wanted to reference the exact stitch out that we have in the tutorial, this is what it actually looks like stitched out in person or on video. And for this one, we actually used buttons that match closely to our base fabric. Um, and so like I was talking about with the other one, we have actually used different colored buttons. For this one, this is an alternate where we used a matching button. So you can pick and choose whichever type of button you liked to use. But now I'm gonna show you actually how to attach the button um, in case you haven't attached one before. So I have these two already with a button that matches the fabric. And for the marking stitch, that's the last step in the design, I have actually put a yellow thread so that it's easy for me to take a look. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to take my needle. It has already been threaded with a matching thread color to my button. And I'm going to tie a little knot. So I like to tie a quilter's knot because it's pretty quick and easy. You can kind of get it over with really fast. So you take the end of your thread and hold it down with your thumb like so. And then you wrap it around the needle a couple of times. I do 
maybe three times, four times, just because I'm a little particular like that. And you have it pinched in between your index and thumb, index finger and your thumb. And you're just going to kind of run that little twist all the way down, pulling and pull it nice and taut. And then you have your quilter's knot. So that's the knot that we're going to start off with to attach our button. So I don't want my knot to show up on the back of my design. I want to hide that knot underneath my button. And you can do it either way you like. So in order to hide it on my button, I'm going to go from the top of the stitch out down. So I'm just going straight down, X marks the spot, and I'm going to pull that on through. And now I'm going to take my button, and I already have the marking stitches, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of fortify those marking stitches because it is a button, so it can be removed. And you want it to be a little bit stronger than, you know, something that's going to, that won't move very much. You want to make sure that stays for a long, long time. So I'm just using the, those marking stitches as my guide. And then I'm going to take my button and I'm going to line up those buttonholes with the X marks that have already been stitched. And I'm just going to quickly do one little loop like so, just to hold it in place so it's not sliding around so much. It does get a little bit squirrely. And then I'm going to take another needle. This one is blunt because I don't want to poke myself on accident. So I'm going to take the blunt needle and actually slide it underneath and then I'm going to pull it taut like that. So I've got this needle here holding it in place and what that's going to do is going to improve the tension for my button because I want to be able to actually insert this button into this buttonhole here. And in order to do that, if it's too tight against this portion here, then it's going to be a little too tight and you won't have these cute little limbs that move back and forth like this. It'll be really, really stiff and you can't move it. So that's why we have this little needle here to hold it in place. So when you are putting your button on, you want to go back and forth between the holes um, about between four to six times. And I would do six just because, you know, you want it to last a long time. You've worked really hard on it, so you deserve to keep it for as long as you want. And so just go through there and continue to do that. Be careful not to poke yourself. I've done it many times, unfortunately. And of course, you also want to avoid getting knots because that's always a bummer. Okay, so I lost count, but <laughs> I think we're pretty close to getting through the holes six times. And another important reason to have a blunt needle or like a, a yarn needle or even um, a bobby pin would work is because as you're working back and forth between these buttonholes, you don't want to accidentally poke yourself. So I like to use something that's blunt and safe on my fingertips. So on the last loop, you have set up. You're going to take your needle and right now this is the back of the design and my thread is coming out from the back and I want to subtly move it towards the front. Slide it through and at this point I can take out this little marking needle and I'll put this back into my little needle holder. And now I'm going to take this thread and wrap it around the button a few times maybe four to five times, maybe six for good luck. Now I'm going to take the needle and thread and thread it back to the underside and that's where I'm going to create my knot. So now that it's back to the underside here, making sure that everything is up to par on the front and I'm just going to create a little knot by looping through 
creating a loop. And to tie the knot, the finishing knot, I just go through that loop two times. One and two. And I pull it nice and tight, like so. Now that it is attached, you trim it, set your needle aside, and you can check and see, make sure that it's nice and strong before you attach it. But at this point, all the pieces are ready to be attached to the little cat. So I don't think it matters too, too much which arm goes where, but I'm just going to put this little arm on the right side. So I'm going to just push this button, just like a regular button on a t-shirt, or not a t-shirt, but a button down shirt, and push that through like so. And then you can test it out, make sure that it stays put nice and strong. And we'll take the next one, do the same thing. Just push that button on through. And if the button doesn't go through, you can do a couple of things. You can really carefully trim the edge of the buttonhole just a tiny bit more, or you can use a smaller button. So what we've done is we just picked the perfect size and the perfect color button to put that in there. But if you're dead set on using a particular button, you can go ahead and make a bigger hole if you want. So now that we have attached all of our buttons, it's ready to hang. So we've got this little piece here. I just need to take out that extra piece of stabilizer. So this top portion here is the loop and you can hang that on a door, which presumably would because it says wipe your paws, but you could put it wherever you like. And it's all set, ready to go. So congratulations, you finished your dangler. So if you liked doing this dangler project, you can go to anitagooddesign.com and look up dangler projects. So every single month in our all access book, we have lots and lots of new projects. If you're looking for dangler specific projects, we also have seasonal danglers and in a lot of Anita's Express projects, we have lots of danglers because not only are they super cute, but they're also really easy to do and they're perfect for beginners and they don't require a lot of materials and a lot of know-how and they're done super quickly. So again, that website is www.anitagooddesign.com. Happy stitching.